Now, this, uh, this topic today is very different. And so, uh, if, did you bring your Bibles with you? Because our talk today is all about the Bible. Okay? Uh, question for all of us here. Na change by life mo last week? Mukhang hindi. Naka-record yun. Okay? <laughs> na change, tanong yung katabi mo. Na, uh, na, na change by yung life mo uh, last, last week? Oh, dapat na change. Okay? Dapat na change. Problema lang, na-cancel, so nabagyo, so nag, nag, uh, nagsaya kayo, nagpahinga. Okay, but uh, why do we need to answer these questions? Why will it change our lives? Because many of us don't realize it, but somehow we are always one step closer to believing in a lie. The world defines truth in different lies. Okay, they define love differently, they define creation in a bang. And we have to find that one truth that we can stand on. And that's the point of that message uh, that we have for today. We have to have a foundation in terms of what we believe in. And, and, and the topic today is focused on the Bible. Tell your seatmate, have you read the Bible? Na quiet time ka na ba? Okay, amin and mama ayan sa D group. Okay, na quiet time ka na ba? <clears throat> okay, um, Cornel West said, There is a price to pay for speaking the truth, there is a bigger price for living a lie. And I, I don't want us to live in a lie because to live in a lie is very difficult. Living in the truth is actually a life that is peaceful, a life that will lead you to better and green pastures. And so what we're going to talk about is this question. Why would I believe that the Bible is absolutely true? Why would I believe that the Bible is absolutely true? Question, do you believe that the Bible is true? I, I'm not convinced. Yes. <laughs> okay. Do you believe that the Bible is true? Yeah. Yes. You, another question that I have for you today is, if you believe that the Bible is true, do you share it? Ah. If you believe that the Bible is true, do you share it to others? Okay. So if you still have doubts, if you have doubts about uh, what we read every week or what we read every day, in our quiet times, I hope that this topic will be able to answer the questions in your mind. So before anything else, can we just bow down our heads and let's pray. Let's commit this time to our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we can be here today to talk about the Bible. And I pray, Lord God, that you will fill us with your spirit, that we will be able to understand every passage, every point, Lord God. We also ask, Lord God, that you will be with us to help us clear any, anything in our minds that's hindering us from really listening to you. And we just surrender this time. We commit this time to you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Okay. So four questions that will change your life. Just want to share with you something about myself. When I was still young, I thought I knew everything about Jesus and about the Bible. I was serving a lot in church um, near our house. I have attended and memorized every bell to ring before communion and even the whole program of a, of a mass. In my mind, I'm better than any other Christian until my life began to be problematic when my dad lost his business. That's when I questioned who God is. Why did he do that? My concern was simple. Is it true that you really love us? If yes, why are you doing this to my family? So this went on for four years, and during that time, I became an unbeliever. I discovered that in times of trials, the so-called truth that I once believed has no ground to stand on. Then my girlfriend, yes, I had a girlfriend. Then my girlfriend started attending a Bible study and invited me, which in my mind, I already know the Bible that they read. I memorized it already because I memorized the program of each Mass I served in. But when I attended Jason or now Elevate, I, um, Elevate Bible Study in UP, when the person teaching an teaching me unpack the verses, that's when I realized that I didn't really know the Bible. And so I attended every Bible study and fell in love with the Word of God. I even asked my D group leader to have Bible study with us daily. That's how much I love to learn from the Bible. That's how much I love to, to understand what simple verses really means. The truth that I once believed in when I was still young was incomplete, and now the truth I heard from the Word of God made it complete. And now I am a full-time worker. 
I'm a full-time worker for high school students. In, I'm, I've been serving here in CCF in Elevate for eight years now. And I have worked in corporations and companies before, before this, but I chose this full-time ministry because I am truly convinced that the Bible is true, it's living, and this can transform your lives and even change the world. Amen? Anyone can choose to focus on being rich, to be famous, or being successful, but I chose full-time ministry because this is what I believe. I am already rich. I am famous in God, and I'm already successful through Christ who strengthens me. Now, how about you? Do you really believe that the Bible, uh, the Bible that you read? So now let's answer that question. Why do I believe that the Bible is absolutely true? Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 21. If you, are, you have your cell phones with you, I have a cell phone here, so let's be techie and all and millennial. <laughs> just get your, if you have a MacArthur Study Bible or if you have a U version, just open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 21. You can flash that on the screen so that it will be easier for them to, to search. Okay, so, you know, the, the good thing about um, Bible apps is that you can highlight. I, I hope you know that. And so it, it will help you, since we'll be reading uh, six verses, it will help you highlight some uh, of the important stuff. Okay, and so let's read. Uh, the Bible verse is also in the screen, but if you want to read on your cell phone, on, in your Bible, if you have a Bible with you, um, you can read there. Okay, let's start. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 21. Let's all stand up, please, and let's start reading verse 16. And it says here, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I, yeah, you may not say it down, sorry. So this is the context. I want you to understand the context. I always like context. So Peter, during that time, um, already know what will happen to him. What will happen to him? He said in verse 14, I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So he already knows he will be martyred. And so, um, we also have to understand the context wherein what, what's happening inside the church. What's happening inside the church during that time is there, there are false teachers teaching lies inside the church. And that's why he wrote this letter so that he can warn the people of God about these false teachers. I think one thing that you will realize is that there are many false teachers even today, who will tell you lies in form of truths. Lies that say that the Bible is not true. Lies that say that there is no God. Lies that say that we evolved from monkeys. Look at your seatmate right now. <laughs> they look human, right? <laughs> okay. That's why we have to be grounded on truth and ask the hard questions. And the hard question that we have to answer right now is, is the Bible absolutely true? Do you truly believe that the Bible is true? If it's your first time, I believe this will help you understand even more why we believe that the Bible is true. And if you've been here for, for so long, this will ground you even more to know that the Bible truly is the real deal, okay? So the question we have to answer in this series, why do I believe what I believe? Why do I believe the Bible? Two things Peter presents as important to know. Two things. And in that passage, I will help you understand. The first thing is the eyewitnesses. And the next thing is evidence. Tell your seatmate, eyewitness. Right now, you are eyewitnesses to this face in front of you. 
Okay, yes. And there is evidence that there is a message on the screen and on my laptop. Okay. <laughs> so in a court case like this one, there are two things that are important to the judge and the jury. Okay? The eyewitnesses and the evidences. This is how you find the truth. And Peter starts with these two things and says, that's in verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths. This is not a myth. This is truth. We didn't create mythology here. We didn't create a Zeus here, okay? This is truth. And it's written there, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We are eyewitnesses. Peter is saying, I saw it. And that's something that we can hold on to. That is truth. When, when, sabi niya, when he received honor and glory from the God the Father in, that, in, in the mountain, we were there, we saw it. It's, it also says in verse 18, we ourselves heard. We didn't just see it, we heard it. For we were with him on the holy mountain. So people have seen it, people have heard it, and they were physically with Jesus to prove it. So they were eyewitnesses. That's number one. Now, even Paul claims this truth. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 6, can we all read this? One, two, three, go. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. There were eyewitnesses. To the truth of Jesus Christ, one person can be lying about the truth of Jesus, but 500 plus people witnessing the same thing, that's not a lie. Look at this, what Lee Strobel said. He went to a psychologist friend and said, if 500 people claim to see Jesus after he died, it was just a hallucination. He said hallucinations are an individual event. If 500 people have the same hallucination, that's a bigger miracle than the resurrection. You understand that? What they saw is true. What they saw is the same. Jesus Christ is true. Next, there are evidences in verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in the dark, knowing this first of all that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is evidence to the truths of Jesus Christ. The Bible accounts for all prophecies about the coming Messiah, which everything was fulfilled. The Bible, which is the best manual for life, side by side with the eyewitness accounts, makes Jesus Christ and the Bible true. Amen? And this is the truth. We have evidence and witnesses to prove the Bible is absolutely true. How can the Bible be absolutely true? I'll give you five proofs that the Bible is the real deal. There are many, but I'll give you five. The first one is the number of manuscripts. The number of manuscripts, let's look at this table. If you look at this table, there are um, some manuscripts about Caesar, about Plato. But look at the, at the end how many manuscripts they had. For Caesar, they only have 10. For Plato, they only have seven. And for this guy, who's hard to pronounce, only eight. Look at the other table. For Tacitus, a Roman historian, okay? Tacitus only had 20 manuscripts. For Homer, I, I believe you, you've studied Homer too. There are 643. But for the New Testament, how many do you have? How many copies do you have? 24,633. The purpose of having a manuscript is very important. You know why? Because the purpose of having more manuscripts is to know if the texts in your Bibles are exactly how the author wrote it based from the original text. So the more manuscripts you have, the easier it is to reconstruct the original. The truth is this. Your Bibles are true. So that's just number one. Number two, we have archaeological facts. This is the Isaiah scroll. 
found in the Dead Sea. So this is the Great Isaiah Scroll. It's, it's one of the original seven Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in Qumran in 1947. And it is the largest and best preserved of all the biblical scrolls. And, this, um, and there are two copies of Isaiah found 1,000 years apart and were discovered to be 95% identical. What happened to the 5%? I'll continue. The 5% variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. So the variations do not affect the message of Revelation in the slightest. Do you understand that? That the very Isaiah um, chapter that you have there is the same. It wasn't changed. It wasn't, uh, the translation didn't change it, okay? The walls of Jericho was found. And there are other archaeological findings that I will share with you in number three, historical accuracy. Look at this. This is Shenasherib's uh, prism found by Taylor. And it tells about King Shenasherib's victory over King Hezekiah and Judah of the Old Testament. So this is a foundation record, okay? So this is intended to preserve King Shenasherib's achievements for posterity and the gods. So it involved the destruction of 46 cities of the state of Judah and the deportation of 200,150 people of Israel. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, is there. If you look at 2 Chronicles 32, verse 1, it says here, After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. And that is written here in this historical historically accurate finding and so there is historical proof and archaeological evidence to back up the old testament how about the new testament let's let's look at the new testament how about pontius pilate who is uh, pontius pilate do you know pontius pilate okay he's a he, he he was a governor but there was a time when this guy was questioned for if if he's if he's real and so, is Pontius Pilate a real person? This was found in the sea. They, they found the name inscripted in this block of rock, okay? Until 1961, there was no concrete archaeological evidence that Pontius Pilate, the fifth governor of Judea, ever existed. There were accounts of him, of course, not least the accounts in the Gospels, but the records of his administration had disappeared completely. No paper, no rolls, no tablets um, with, with his name on it. In the summer of 1961, however, it, Italian archaeologists found a piece of limestone in the ruins of a sports stadium in Caesarea beside the sea. And they found the name Pontius Pilate. If Pontius Pilate is real, is Jesus real? Now that's the next question. Do you know this guy? This Josephus or Josephus, whatever <laughs> translation. Okay, Josephus in his uh, historical book Antiquities of the Jews. But before that, Josephus is a Jewish priest, also a commander in Galilee who surrendered to Rome after the Jewish revolt against Rome, said in the Antiquities of the Jews. And so this is what he wrote about Jesus Christ. Okay, are you excited? Okay. It says here, about this time lived Jesus a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was the achiever of extraordinary deeds and was a teacher of those who accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah when he was in indicted by the principal men among us, and Pilate condemned him to be crucified. Those who had come to love him originally did not cease to do so, for he appeared to them on the third day, restored to life as the prophets of the deity had foretold these and countless other mar marvelous things about him and the tribe of the Christians so named after him has not disappeared to this day. And up to this day, this generation, we have not disappeared. Up to this day. And that is the truth. Jesus is real. Another historical man, Cornelius Tacitus, you, uh, when we were looking at the, the table, we saw the name Tacitus. And so Cornelius Tacitus was a Roman senator, orator, and arguably the best of Roman historians. And during the time of Nero, he wrote about how Nero burned part of a town in Rome and shifted the blame to Christians. And this is what he wrote. 
Neither human effort nor the emperor's generosity nor the placating of the gods ended the scandalous belief that the fire had been ordered by Nero. Therefore, to put down the rumor, Nero substituted as culprits and punished in the most unusual ways those hated for their shameful acts whom the crowd called Christians. The founder of this name, Christ, Christus in Latin, had been executed in the reign of Tiberius by the procurator Pontius Pilate. Everything is written in history. And Jesus is real. He is written in history. Another quote by Lee Strobel. He, and he says this. He says here, put all this together, Josephus, the Roman historians and officials, the Jewish writings, the letters of Paul and the apostolic fathers, and you've got persuasive evidence that corroborates all these, the essentials found in the biographies of Jesus Christ. Now do you believe? But there's more, okay? That's the truth about creation. The truth about creation. Let's look at this. That God made the earth hang on nothing. Job chapter 26, verse 7. Can we all read this? One, two, three, go. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. And this is, a, and this is the truth, okay? That we, the earth is floating right now on nothing. Another scientific truth that can be found in, in, in our Bibles God created a round earth. Isaiah, Sindito, ano, flat earthers. Sorry, okay? Even God believes the, the earth is round. Okay? Isaiah 40, verse 22. Can we all read this? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. The earth is round, guys. The next one. Hydrologic cycle. Let's see that. In Job 36, verse 27 to 28, can you all read this? For he draws up the drops of water, they distill his mist in rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. That's the hydrologic cycle. And God created that cycle. How about the complexities of life? How about the complexities of animals? Let's just look at one animal and let's talk about this guy. Okay, the giraffe. You know that the, the giraffe has the highest blood pressure of all animals. Why? Because they're, they, so, they are so very tall, uh, th their blood should be able to really run around their whole body in that it has to reach the, the head. Okay? If it doesn't reach the head, they're dead. Okay? But the problem is whenever they drink water like just this one, okay, if God did not create them in a way that they will be able to sustain life, when their necks are down, that head will pop. But since God created them with complexity and with, with sureness, that giraffe is still alive and standing up. Okay? And you know that the, uh, in, in the giraffe, the valves were created to be able to pump through that neck so that it will be able to sustain that kind of tall. Uh, tall guy or tall animal. Another thing, the complexity of creation in your eyes. Uh, can you just look at your seatmate right now? Look at their eyes. Do you feel in love? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, wrong uh, series. Wrong series. That was for a uh, Valentine series. But uh, if you look at the eye, okay, the complexity of the eye, the lens carries out this adjustment every second of our lives and makes no mistakes. Photographers make the same adjustments in their cameras by hand. And you will notice this, that even if you put light on your eye, the other person looking at your eye will see that, uh, I forgot the center, or that's the cornea. It will, uh, it will be uh, so small. You know, that kind of complexity was designed but by uh, an intelligent God. Because it's impossible for it to be a product of chance. You know, it's impossible for it to be a product of random, random Big Bang thing. Okay? So God created our eyes so we can enjoy the view. And are you enjoying the view of your seatmate? Yes. Yeah, this is God's creation. Amen. God created everything so good that in Genesis 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God created everything in the beginning. Everything points to a God who created these complex and well thought of creations to sustain us. As uh, this NASA guy, um, John O'Keefe says, if the universe had not been made with the most exacting precision, we could never have come into existence. It is my view that these circumstances indicate the, the universe was created for man to live in. That if, if earth was a little bit closer to the sun, the earth will be unlivable. The earth was designed for us to be able to live in. And only God can make that happen. Only a God who can make the impossible happen can make that happen. Number five, Jesus believed in the scriptures. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he used scriptures. If, if you remember, he was tempted to eat. You can make that rock uh, into bread. And he says, man does not live by bread alone, but man, man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And these are the three things that he he thwarted every temptation of Satan. And he used these three Old Testament passages. In verse uh, 16 of chapter 6, We shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. Or verse 13, It is the Lord your God, you shall fear him, you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. And, all, and Jesus Christ will always use the scripture to make a point. You remember when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What was the greatest commandment? To what? To love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And the other one is the same. To love other. Anyan? To love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus went back to the scripture. And so Jesus believed in the scriptures. Jesus went back to the scripture to make those points. Why do I believe that the Bible is absolutely true? Number one, there's the number of manuscripts proves that the Bible is real. Archaeological facts prove that the Bible, whatever it contains, whatever happened in history, historical accuracy, it's there. Truth about creation, science is there. If, 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 if you think about it, um, Christians started science, okay? Number five, Jesus believed in scriptures. And these are just a few of the evidences that presents reliable truths about the word of God. And in my research, if I was to tell you every evidence, it would take one school year to finish. You want to try it now? Okay, so, so let's not go home. <laughs> okay, so that's just five proofs. But what should we do with this truth? I think that's, that's the most important thing. What should we do with these truths? If we know that the Bible is true and yet do nothing, then you are being a hypocrite. If the Bible is true, it should change lives and it will change lives and it will change your life and it should change the life of the person you're with, your friends, your classmates. What are you doing with your Bible? It's in your cell phones. It's your, in, in your bag. What are you doing with it? And so... Just one point and one application that I want to share with you is as simple as this. Love and obey God's word. Can you just tell your teammate, love and obey God's word. You have to learn to love and obey God's word. Okay? You have to learn to love and obey God's word. Three things. How, to, how do we apply it? Siempre, number one, read the Bible daily. Tell your teammate, read the Bible daily. If you can just repeat it over and over again, read the Bible daily. Okay, who here is missing their quiet time today? Just uh, don't, don't raise your hands, okay? <laughs> Be accountable to your D-group leaders because they want to check if you are okay, why are you? If you're reading the Bible, that's good. If you're not reading the Bible, why? If there are evidences to prove that this is true, then why are you not reading the manual for life? In Joshua 1 verse 8, can we all read this? One, two, three, go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You want to be successful? Yes. It's written there. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. 
How? Meditate on God's Word. Tell the seatmate, meditate on God's Word. Meditate on it. Okay? If you don't read it, how will you, how will you be successful? How will you live a life that is totally grounded on God's Word? You have to read it. The next one is obey the Bible. Tell your seatmate, obey the Bible. Obey the Bible daily. It says in James 1, 20, can we all read that again? 1, 2, 3, go. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Let's not be um, Saturday Christians. Lots na Sunday Christians now eh. So Saturday, this is Saturday. So let's not be Saturday Christians. So we just go here and attend the service. And after that, we lose our, all our Christianity in front of our friends while we curse and while we steal, while we do all of the th evil things that we can do. I hope that you will obey. I hope that you will apply God's word. Because if this is true, and what's written in the word is true, then you shouldn't miss obeying the word of God. If God says there that everyone who does evil, who sins, goes to hell, I'll, uh, come on, let's be sure that... Uh, that we will do it because the truth is those who don't obey God, those who, don't, those who, don't, who have no faith in God will not go to, to heaven and will go to hell. So, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Another thing, share the Bible daily. I think this is one thing that uh, all of us should be able to do. Even if we are introverts and, that's, and many of us post in Facebook that if we are introvert, you know, we cannot do this. No. Even if you are an introvert, this is a command for us. This is a command. Even in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, what, what does it say there? Uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, teaching them, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And that's even the mission of CCF. That's the passage that we're using for the mission. And if you're not sharing that, we're not doing the mission. If you're not doing the mission, you're not obeying God. Because it says here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And that's the Bible for us. Again, the reason... The reason why I came here as a full-time worker is because I believe this. And many people in the past who died to proclaim the word of God died believing in this truth. How much more you guys who are seated here, who is listening to God's word, being preached to you, what more are we called to do? We are all called to do this, to read it, to obey it, and to share it. Again, what's the main point? Love and obey God's word. See, the rules of survival. The rule of survival is read the Bible daily, obey the Bible daily, and share the Bible daily. Okay? <laughs> okay? Okay, so before anything else, can we all stand up, please? Um, I'm amazed. Today I am fast, okay? But uh, by the grace of God only. But uh, um, can I ask the music team to go up the stage? And I'm, I'm going to ask everyone to just please go near to the stage so that we can close this time in prayer. Come on. So that we can worship God again and just praise Him for who He is and what He has done for us. Again, what's the point? Love and obey God's word. Read the Bible, obey the Bible, share the Bible daily. And let's pray. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, Lord God, that even for such a short message, Lord, that you, that you can actually use this time, maybe to encourage us, but for most of us to convict us, Lord, to convict us of why we're not making it our, the most important day or time of our day of our lives to read your word. 
And Lord, we just ask, Lord God, for forgiveness. That we take reading of your word and meditating it and obeying it and sharing it lightly. Lord, we pray. Lord, change our hearts. Take away our blind eyes that we will be able to see that your word is that lamp on a dark place, on a dark world. Your word, that if we live it out, if we, if we apply it in our lives, that we, we ourselves will be lights to help the lost find their way. Lord, we know, Lord God, that that you are real, that you are true. And we believe that, that if you are true, that we will truly be different. You said in your word, be holy as you are holy. It's also saying that we have to be unique. We have to be different. We have to be set apart from this world. And so help us, Lord God, to live this life for you. Help us, Lord God, to read your word. Help us, Lord, to to stand on that foundation, Lord God. Jesus is real. The Bible is real. That we can be courageous because you are with us. Because you said in your word that you will give us the Holy Spirit to empower us. And so we can do more that you have done. And we can do it now. So I pray for today, Lord God, is simple, Lord, that we, that if we truly believe you, Lord, help us. Help us to be good examples of people who really meditate your word. Who really read it, obey it, and share it. Thank you, Lord, for this message. And Lord, I pray, Lord God, for those who are, who are seeking, have more questions. I pray, Lord God, that you will continue to speak to them. Continue to open their minds to this truth, Lord God. Continue, Lord God, to just help them encounter you. Because you are a personal God, and we believe that. You are a personal God who wants to have a relationship with us. Help them, Lord God, to see you in a different light. We love you so much. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.